I want you to imagine that you are watching a play. The curtain goes up on a darkened stage. The light design tells us that the setting is nighttime. Jesus sits alone in an outdoor courtyard on one corner of the stage when Nicodemus sneaks on stage from the other side. His cautious walk tells us he does not want to be caught coming to see this radical teacher that has been causing a stir would not be good for Nicodemus and his community. We watch Jesus engage in dialogue with Nicodemus for a while, but it is apparent that Nicodemus is not ready for this conversation. His gestures and his facial expressions tell us that he's confused and befuddled. Of course he is. Jesus is using words that have double meaning only to Jesus. For example, the word translated in the text as from above means both again and from above. It has both a spiritual and a time reference. However, Nicodemus can only comprehend the chronological time of the words and therefore asks, how can anyone be born again after having grown old? How can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? This misses Jesus's point entirely. It's impossible for Nicodemus to really learn anything from this conversation in the way that he is accustomed to learning. He is a learned religious teacher. He's coming to a religious teacher for dialogue. But teaching Nicodemus in the way that he's used to, according to the customs of Jewish learning, is not Jesus's priority here. Soon it's as if all the lights on the stage go out except for the dramatic spotlight which Jesus steps into the spotlight away from Nicodemus, takes center stage and gives a monologue. Here in this monologue is perhaps the most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. And the equally important second verse, which follows that, indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In these verses, Jesus concludes and summarizes his whole monologue, explaining his own role in the Trinity and in the work of salvation. Jesus descended from heaven, for God sent the Son. The Son of Man must be lifted up, and all of this is for the sake of salvation. The things Jesus is telling Nicodemus is not the stuff of intellectual understanding. It is the stuff of faith and experience. That is not to say that the two are mutually exclusive. Knowledge and faith have intermingled all throughout the history of Christianity. But there are mysteries within our faith that we cannot wrap our limited human minds around. To try to pour the vastness of who God is and how God is in our world into the limited vessels of the human mind leads us into oversimplification, heresy, and at times harm to each other. At times we are called to simply embrace the mystery. But the invitation to mystery is not a call to blind faith. Reading a script for a play or even writing a paper about that play is a very different way of knowing than performing or watching a play be performed. When you read a script, you may not fully understand the whole of the play without the movement of the actors across the stage, the embodiment of the emotions the actors convey through facial expressions and posture and reactions or the hush in moments of dramatic silence. Even the cadence of the words themselves in the performance of a skilled actor can give the words a totally different meaning than when you read it straight off the page. And reading a script doesn't fully tell us about the dynamic between the characters, nor does it capture the buzz behind stage or in the audience as the curtain rises or falls. We too have the tools at our disposal to help us understand and believe without fully wrapping our intellectual and logic-loving minds around these truths. 
Like performers and audience members at a play, we too have tools like experience, embodiment, and bearing witness. The Holy Spirit helps us embrace these mysteries. Jesus' explanation of the Spirit's work in this text is what makes this text so appropriate for today's celebration of Trinity Sunday. Jesus tells us that the Spirit of God moves like the wind. You cannot see it or really comprehend it, but you know that it's there. You are aware of it through your experience of it. Think of the wind on your face during a day at the beach or when you have to steel yourself against the wind when you are walking during a blustery storm. In the same way, we are aware of the Spirit because of our experience of it. We experience the Holy Spirit when we feel compelled to move deeper into our faith, when we are called to a new ministry or when we feel connected to our siblings in Christ as we walk through an experience that we can't wrap our minds around. It is only through the work of the Spirit that we are able to see and embrace the truths that Jesus is offering to Nicodemus and to us. And one of these truths that we must be born of water and the Spirit is the act of baptism. We experience the work of the Holy Spirit when the waters of baptism cleanse us of our sins and usher us into rebirth and acceptance into the Christian community. But baptism itself is a mystery. We as Christians have spent centuries writing and thinking about what it really means to be born of water and the Spirit, trying to make sense of these cryptic words that Jesus offers to Nicodemus. But in baptism... We have a way for us to experience rebirth by water and the Spirit. We might not be able to fully articulate how or when exactly the waters of baptism cleanse us and usher us into Christian community, but we know that it does because we have experienced it. Thus, baptism offers a way for us to experience the grace of God, not just with our minds, but with our bodies. And the work of the Spirit is simply one part of the whole trinity— And the Trinity is not something, again, that we are meant to wrap our minds around, but to experience. You often hear the Trinity referred to as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Creator, Christ, and Holy Ghost in gender-neutral terms. You can also refer to the Trinity as the active role that each person plays in the Trinity. God, the Creator, Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, the Sustainer. Calling on the creator, redeemer, and sustainer can help us identify our own experiences of the Trinity. The creator, of course, created the vastness and diversity of creation, and you. Have you ever looked at a spectacular sunset and marveled at the fact that the same creator of this universe, of the light of this moment, also created you? And the work of the creator is never done, for the creator creates, recreates the world every day, making all things new. The redeemer in the person of Jesus redeems all of creation. He liberates us from sin, death, and oppression, and reconciles all things to God's self. The sustainer in the person of the Holy Spirit sustains us through the hard work of living a Christian life. It supports and comforts us in times of trial and draws and beckons us into new ways of being, ever deeper into the mysteries of God's grace. Throughout our whole lives, we indeed encounter many mysteries that we cannot wrap our minds around. It is not just the mysteries of our faith. In a few minutes, we will sing the hymn, I was there to hear your burning cry a hymn that articulates God's love and presence at each stage of our life. From our first cry to, at birth to our last breath, we encounter grief so deep and joy so great we cannot fully fathom it. Even when there are logical answers to the questions of life, even when there are answers to how we ended up in social certain circumstances, or there are social, political, and economic explanations for war and violence and suffering, those answers are never really truly enough to explain the existence of violence and suffering. 
So many answers that we have at our disposal are not satisfying answers for our souls. On the other end, when we find ourselves in a deeply satisfying and joy-filled relationship of any kind, or perhaps when we hold a baby for the first time, we may wonder at the incredible beauty of this life or how beauty and risk and vulnerability can exist so intensely and so simultaneously. This is a beauty we cannot rationalize or reduce to mere logic. The mysteries of our faith help us practice embracing all the mysteries of life, the unknown, the uncertain, and the mysterious with curiosity when we cannot wrap our minds around the past, present, or future. Knowledge and learning are tools at our disposal to help us understand all of these things, and yet I think that experience, embodiment, and bearing witness through the Holy Spirit picks up the work of faith, where our ability to intellectually understand something fails. These tools are part of our Wesleyan heritage. In the Methodist tradition, today, this Sunday, is also Aldersgate Sunday, when we celebrate John Wesley's conversion experience. On May 24, 1738, John Wesley experienced assurance of his own salvation. Wesley had reluctantly attended a group meeting that evening on Aldersgate Street in London. As he heard a reading from Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans, he felt his heart strangely warmed. And as usual, Wesley kept a very detailed journal, so he wrote in his journal that at 8.45 p.m. that evening, while the preacher was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Jesus Christ, Wesley wrote, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. So for all of his learning and studying and preaching and teaching, John's experience of the Holy Spirit and the strange warmth in his heart is what led him to truly understand his own faith and comprehend his own salvation. Experience is an essential part of our understanding of God in the United Methodist Church. We categorize experience alongside reason, scripture, and tradition as ways that God reveals God's self to us in every age. Experience gives us new ways to see the living truth in scripture. It confirms the biblical message for our present. It illumines our understanding of God and creation and motivates us to make sensitive moral judgments. So says our theological task of the United Methodist Church. But it is not only our individual experiences, it is our collective experience here on earth that informs our understanding of God. Just as Jesus said in his monologue, the Son came into the world to save all of creation. Jesus is not talking about an individual experience of, cre of salvation, but a collective one. Treating collective experience, especially those experiences that differ from our own, as a tool for understanding God's presence in our world, calls us to turn our attention away from our own experience in order to bear witness to the experience of others. We are especially called to bear witness and not turn away from the experiences of violence, suffering, and oppression. The Holy Spirit is present in the midst of our experiences and our witness of others' experiences so that we may be moved into deeper relationship with God and simultaneously be moved into more care-filled, honest, and transformative relationships with each other. Only when we are open to the way the Spirit moves us, like the unpredictable wind, and only when we are born of water and the Spirit can we truly comprehend all that God invites us to know. Beyond the limits of our own understanding, our own human reason, we can embrace the mysteries of our own and each other's belovedness, the mystery of salvation, and with the sis sustaining of the spirit, we can experience and bear witness to all of the incredible joy and profound grief of our shared lives together. 
by God's grace, made known to us through the work of the Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God.